Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Welcome to my video on significance, effect size, and error. Uh, these concepts are often confused. Uh, they're not always explained clearly in text, so I want to take some time in a separate video to cover um, these three areas specifically uh, as it relates to uh, research in the social sciences. So let's get started with statistical significance. So the, the, the question answered by statistical significance is this. Is the result due to the treatment or is it due to random error? So that's what we want to know. When we say results are significant, that just that doesn't mean they're just uh, important, um, or should we, we we might look into them further or something like that. Uh, significance, statistical significance, has a specific meaning, and that's to determine the probability that random error was responsible for the results. The way we determine statistical significance is by using inferential statistics. Uh, that is, uh, statistics run on a data set which represents a sample of a population. So it's important to understand that if you have an entire population, you don't need to use inferential statistics. Inferential st statistics infer from a sample what is probably going on with an entire population. That's why they're called inferential statistics. Whether you're running a, a t-test or an ANOVA or any other number of statistics, uh, the result in terms of in terms of the statistics that have a result of telling you whether you have statistical significance or not the result is a probability that's that's the ultimate result of inferential statistics it's a probability specifically the probability that the observed scores are due to chance alone so if you run a, an ANOVA for instance and you receive uh, you you get a p-value, that's a probability value, of say 1%. That tells you there's a 1% chance that the scores that you have occurred, resulted, through random error alone, by chance alone. So what we say is if the the statistic, if the probability is less than the alpha, which is a, the, the probability value that we set, which is the social sciences, usually 5%. So if it's less than the alpha, the result is considered statistically significant. So you can see right away that uh, if, if every uh, research project uses an alpha, of 5% and not all do but if everyone did we would be uh, we would think there was we would think the treatment was having an effect uh, and 5% of the time would be wrong okay we're, we're willing to accept that 1 out of 20 times that we're wrong so if if, if you run a statistic on a particular experiment, let's just, uh, let me just create an experiment uh, for the purposes of, of illustrating these points. Uh, you have a special treatment that you think uh, alleviates symptoms of depression. So you take a random sample of people that suffer from depression and you randomly assign them to a control group and a treatment group. And then you run your treatment uh, uh, on just the treatment group, and the control group 
uh, either has nothing or gets treatment as usual. And you get two sets of data. Right? You, you get two sets of scores from, say, some sort of depression inventory. So then what you're, what you're asking in the statistics, when you run them, is are, are these um, two sets of values, these two sets of scores from the control group, one set of scores, and the other set of scores from the treatment group, are they statistically significantly different? Right, that's what you're asking. And with the alpha set at 5%, 5% of the time, uh, there will be uh, no difference between those two groups, but uh, you think there is, right? And we'll talk about that a little more, um, a little later, uh, and a little more later in this um, video all right, about, about error and how that works. But this is really the, the uh, cornerstone I want you to understand about statistical significance. It has a specific meaning, and it's the probability that scores are due to random error. Right. So let's take a look at effect size. Statistical significance is different than effect size. So in that example I gave you uh, in, uh, in the last slide, where you have a control group and you have uh, a treatment group. Right? You, you, you would hope, uh, as the researcher, you're hoping to find some difference there. Uh, although you're willing to, to go where the data takes you, uh, you're hoping to find a difference, or you wouldn't have put together the treatment and put together the experiment. You could have statistical significance. You could find a statistically significant result between those two groups, but still have a small effect size. What, if th what the effect size is, is, it tells us how much change in the dependent variable. So in, in the case I'm, I'm giving you the example, it would be the scores on a depression inventory. So how much change in the dependent variable can be explained by the independent variable. Another way to put that is how much shared variance is there between the IV and the DV. So again, a result can be statistically significant but not have a large effect size. In most every uh, journal that you would want to submit a manuscript to, in terms of the social sciences, you need to report effect size. Uh, and since as, as n grows, as your sample size increases, especially into the, uh, you know, the thousands, if you have a really large sample size, statistical significance is not that hard to achieve. Uh, effect size is really uh, what's important. Uh, significance is important. You really can't do much without significance. But once you have that, you also need uh, at least a small effect size to have a, a meaningful result. Of course, the absence of an effect size and, st and statistical significance can also be a meaningful result. You know, uh, there is a publishing bias in journals where they like to publish articles where significance was found. But say that there is a gold standard treatment for depression and you use that, uh, and you find there that the, the group that received the treatment and the group that did not, you know, there was no difference between them, uh, and the, the, uh, the effect size is very small, that would be an important finding. That, that would be a, an example of an important finding uh, that was important because it did not reach statistical significance. So let's look at some measures. Uh, Pearson's product moment correlation coefficient, otherwise known as Pearson's R, is a statistic uh, that measures the linear relationship uh, between two sets of, uh, you know, two variables, right? So um, when we say that there's a correlation, right, we're usually talking about Pearson's R. 
and uh, this would be this would not be getting into causality this is just relationship so you wouldn't be saying for example if you had variable X and variable Y you wouldn't be saying that a variable X causes variable Y just that to some degree X and Y move together they have a they have a um, degree of linear relationship, uh, or they don't. So, uh, you know, Pearson's R runs from negative one to one. Negative one and one are very strong correlations. Uh, negative one would be x goes up and y goes down, right? And one would be x goes up and y goes up. Those are perfect correlations, right? So every one unit that x went up y would go down one unit for negative one, you know, r, r value of negative one, or up one unit for an r value of one. And then zero would be a, uh, no, there'd be no relationship. It was a zero correlation. So there's no hard and fast rules for what's a strong relationship and what's a moderate, uh, but a general rule is that uh, Anything, an R value uh, greater than 0.7 or, or less than negative 0.7 is a very strong relationship. Uh, a strong relationship is indicated by a correlation of 0.4 or negative 0.4, moderate 0.3, uh, and weak anything less than 0.3. Now, R squared, uh, so when you, when, you, when you square R, we call R squared, it's called the coefficient of determination. And that's a little different. Uh, what that tells you is uh, how much, it, that's really uh, what we think of uh, more when we think of effect size. We think more of R squared than we do of correlation. So that's truly uh, how much change in the uh, dependent variable is explained in the independent variable. So how, you know, how many units is the dependent variable moving uh, for every one unit that the independent variable moves? And of course, the way you, you reach the coefficient of determination is to square uh, the R value. So if the R value was uh, 0.5, the coefficient of determination would be 0.25. All right, so important difference to understand there. Uh, effect size is different than significance, and effect size should be reported. And really, effect size is, is quite useful to understand uh, as you look at uh, research projects. So let's take a look at error. Uh, this is uh, an area, uh, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, all these are areas where there's a lot of confusion. Uh, I like to try to keep this as straightforward as possible when explaining it. Uh, so let me start with um, the concept of error and where error comes from. When we talk about type 1 and type 2 error, we're not talking about human error. We're not talking about a mistake that a researcher makes. We're talking about the result of using inferential statistics. Inherently, uh, there's going to be error when using inferential statistics. Again, the way to eliminate all error, uh, which of course is very difficult, is to, is to gather data from an entire population. So short of that, there's always going to be error. Even if you had 99% of the population, you would still have error because you wouldn't know uh, exactly what's going on with that one percent that you don't have. But usually, uh, for the type of populations we work with, meaning all people that suffer depression, all people that suffer from anxiety disorders, uh, we're sampling a very small number, of a very small percentage of the population. So let's take a look at the two types of error. Type 1 error is where The null hypothesis, right, represented here by H uh, zero, the null hypothesis is rejected 
when it was actually true. That's a type 1 error. So when, when the null hypothesis is rejected, but the null hypothesis was actually true. Right, this is usually the type of error that we think of when we think of research studies, uh, especially if we don't think of it in terms of a, it's a mathematical or statistical product. We think of it more as a, uh, you know, what a researcher does. This is where uh, you know, a researcher would indicate that there was a difference between x and y when really there wasn't. Okay, but remember, it's not, it's not the researcher's fault. It's not researcher bias. It's, a, it's due to the statistical processes. But this is the first error that comes to mind. When we think of a, making this, you know, a, an error in statistics, we think uh, of a researcher saying there's a, a significant finding when there's not. So they, they accept the alternative hypothesis. They reject the null hypothesis, even though the null, hy null hypothesis is actually true. The risk of a type 1 error is equal to the alpha. So if the alpha is set at 0 0.01, there's a 1% chance of a type 1 error. So the higher the alpha value, the higher the risk of a type 1 error. So if the alpha, now, now this is would be very unusual, but the, if the alpha was set at, say, 0.1 or 10%, uh, that's a higher alpha, right? That increases the risk. Now the chance of a type 1 error occurring would be 10%. So figuring out the, the quantity or, the, or, the, or the, uh, the probability, rather, of a type 1 error is actually fairly easy. It's, it's equivalent to the alpha. So a type 2 error is the opposite. A type 2 error is accepting the null hypothesis right, when it was false. So, so in that example with the depression you know, and, and the, the control group and, and, the, and the treatment group, uh, you know, there, there, there is actually a difference between the, gr the two groups, but uh, the data shows, the, the results show that uh, we should accept the, the null hypothesis. We should accept that the the two groups are not different, uh, but they actually are. So it's accepting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. A lower alpha increases the risk of a type 2 error. So as you move from, uh, say, 0.05, to 0 0.01 uh, or to 0 0.001, as you move in that direction, you know, lower alpha values, you increase the risk of a type 2 error. Uh, uh, the type 1 error is called an alpha error. The type 2 error is called a beta error. There is a way to calculate the probability of a type 2 error or beta error. Uh, but it's beyond the scope of, of uh, what I'm going to uh, teach as far as the statistics. You just need to know there is a way to calculate uh, type 2 error. Uh, not nearly as easy as uh, simply reading the alpha, which is the way to, to figure out the type 1 error. It's a more, uh, well, it's a relatively complex equation, but it is possible to determine the risk of a type 2 error. So I want to thank you for um, watching this video. I hope that uh, these you have a better understanding of these three areas, significance, uh, effect size, and error. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me and I'll be happy to help you. Thanks.